Hello, I'm Kieran Lynch and welcome to Ovicast, the Chocolate Sheep Podcast. Each episode will bring you the latest insights, advice and technical updates for the sheep industry. As we head into peak lambing season, we also start to encounter flock health issues on farms. We're joined by Dr. Shane McGettrick of the Department of Agriculture Region Veterinary Laboratories in Sligo to discuss addressing these issues in more detail. Shane starts us off by describing the common issues to see in the lab at this stage of the season. He takes us through the submission procedure for samples, what is required, and we discuss the timeline from submission of those samples until the results are available. Now, some of these conditions that cause issues in farms are zoonotic, particularly in the case of a number of the abortive agents. Shane highlights why we need to take extra care to protect human health during this busy period. We also discuss why aborted yews should be isolated from the main flock early to minimise spread. With Shane finishing up, urgent caution for those farmers to consider purchasing foster yews and introduce them to the flock during this busy period. We start off, however, with Shane encouraging farmers to submit samples where they encounter problems with abortion or increased mortality this spring to identify the cause and start to address the issue. The main reason you need to submit to a, a regional vet lab is to try and get a diagnosis. And the earlier you get the diagnosis, the earlier you're going to be able to really tackle the problem that's happening there on the farm. The problem with all of this is that um, it, it's very hard to know which is the first of an outbreak. Um, so my advice to people when it comes to, especially when it comes to abortions in, in lambs, is that you're better to be safe than sorry. So, you know, you're, you're, you're as well to get in the first abortions into the lab. And there's a lot of reasons why a, a yolk can abort, and we can go into them a bit later on. But if, if you get uh, uh, the first abortion in, it's more likely you're going to get a quick diagnosis there on it. And by the time that maybe you're starting to see problems in other yolks, God forbid if that's happening, at least you know what you're tackling and you know what you need to do. So that's the main reason that guys need to get the um, uh, lambs into us early and to get samples into us early. It's a busy time of year in the springtime as well, here, and So um, vets are very busy, farmers are very busy. And it's very hard for guys to sometimes, you know, think of going to the lab and get, put, put themselves together to go to the lab. But um, it's, it's something that I think is worth doing. And Shane, look, it is a busy period. It's also the time of year we start to see these problems occurring on farms or heading to peak lambing period. Typically, Shane, what do you see coming into the lab in terms of abortions or losses at this time of year? What are the common ones you see? Yeah, so this is this is real abortion season for us um, in this part of the country. So in 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 the I'm based in Sligo in the northwest. So we see an awful lot of sheep abortions during February and March. In, in the other labs, maybe that are dealing with earlier lamb and yola, lowland flocks, they might see their peak abortion as a little bit earlier in the year. So that might be January, February is when they see most of the things coming in. So I split uh, abortions in my own head. I split them up into three different main categories. And um, the first thing to point out to everyone is that not all abortions are infectious, but some are. So the first category I'd have would be infectious abortions. So they'd be things like your toxoplasma, your enzootic abortion caused by chlamydia. And there's a load of other bacteria that can go in there and cause problems. You know, you can get lepto. We sometimes see coxiella. We sometimes see salmonella abortions. There's a lot of different infectious causes that can be there, but really they only account for maybe a third of the overall submissions we get. So that's the first category. The second category I would um, mention then would be non-infectious causes things that happen spontaneously so maybe that they maybe that the yos themselves have been moved or that they've got a knock and usually those ones will show up as one-offs in a flock you know you won't get you it'd be very unusual you get a storm due to that so that's the second category it'd be the spontaneous individual abortions and then the third category that i have in my head for trying to categorize these things is ones that are related to the health of the yo and um, increasingly we see more and more of these where um the yo herself might be sick, maybe due to a nutritional problem, a metabolic problem there that she's she's coming towards the end of pregnancy. Maybe she's not able to sustain the pregnancy anymore. So twin lamb disease, those types of things come into this and they can result in not so much your classic um, aborted rotten, rotten fetuses, but they can result in, in uh, uh, stillborn lambs, in lambs with very low uh, vitality when they're born, premature lambs. And so you know, I think it's important for people out there that are, you know, that unfortunately experience dead lambs um, from a yo, that they think to themselves, well, like, does this look like it could be infectious? Is it something that this yo has got a knock? 
or is it something that's going on here with my yo flock that maybe that they're they're not as good as they should be in terms of nutrition or that there's something that's just askew there and each of those different categories need to be addressed slightly differently Jim, if they encounter abortions, hopefully most flocks won't, but if they do encounter them, and you indicated earlier, that tends to be at the start of the and maybe when there is a bit of time to go about and look about these things. Where's the starting point for that? How do they go about submitting samples or where should they start? Yeah, so as I say, the most crucial thing is to get the samples into us quickly. Um, some, some people are very used to submitting to the RVLs. You know, we have, we, we, I mean, we've done our own um, research on this ourselves and we know that people closest to the RVLs that are located geographically closest are most likely to submit to us but when it comes to sheep there's a lot of heavy sheep areas we say up in North Donegal over in Galway that might be uh, in Kerry that are are, are located quite a distance from um, RVLs and they're the ones where they don't get the samples into us early enough in my opinion so the way you go about getting a sample in first off you need to talk to your vet. They, they, and, and it's a weakness I see it when it comes to um, sheep, sheep farming in general, is that maybe the relationship with the vets there aren't as strong as they are in cattle farming, where there's an annual TB test, where the vet is probably more likely to be on the farm on a regular basis. But having said that, I, I see that um, the vets are, you know, they're very tuned in to sheep diseases and they're, they're very good at dealing with them. So you know, and especially when it comes to an abortion outbreak, the vets themselves know that the you need to get a you need to get a, a diagnosis early on in these in these cases. So, when it comes to doing that, the, if you contact if the farmer contacts the vet, tell them that they have a problem occurring here that maybe a yo has aborted, they'd like to get it tested. The vet then will um, make contact with us in the RVLs in whatever is the closest one, and all of the vet practices have a relationship with their local RVL, so they'll tell you where to go you then usually give the the rvl a shout give them a ring and tell them that you're coming in just to just to book it in and in case that there's any problem on a particular day some days this time of year we're just very busy and maybe we might be able to take it that evening but we'd be able to take it the next morning so to 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 get the the um, material into us and i'll talk a little bit about the type of material if you want karen and just you mentioned their timing as well probably two critical things Shane the timing of getting the sample there promptly but take us through what should be submitted like we talked a lot about abortions and look we have lamb mortality you mortality deal with as well but in the case of an abortion what samples do you require so the, the main thing we require is the aborted fetus themselves and the placenta a lot of people forget to give us the placenta and the placenta is where we get most of our good diagnostic material there, especially if it is from a, an infectious cause of abortion. So if you have a toxo or a chlamydia, so an enzo abortion there in a, in a yo, where that, where that real damage is done, it's done to the placenta. And that's where we're going to get the best chance of getting an isolate or where we're going to get the best chance of identifying the actual agent that's causing it. So, um, they, 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 so to answer your question, a fetus and the placenta that it came out. And even if that placenta, even if it's just a remnant of the placenta, I think sometimes people feel that if the, if the whole placenta doesn't come, which is typical enough in an in a, in abortion where, you know, it's fragment and it's breaking up, it's smelly. Um, you know, you should still, even if it's a remnant of it that you have in a glove, don't be, don't be worried about it. Bring it into us because we're we're well used to the smelly material. We're well used to dealing with it. And for me, I'm always happy to see a placenta with it because I know that if I have the placenta and the fetus together, it gives me the best chance of getting a good diagnosis for that farmer. Just when you mentioned glove, we even risk me not just find out maybe just make sure it's a clean bag or glove that you carry the material in that you're not introducing some other infection with how you're transporting yeah, well, it. Yeah, but don't disinfect anything. Um, mm. You know, uh, uh, when I'm doing my swabs for um, a chlamydia or a toxo, I'll actually swab the bag. It comes in as well, simply because I'm not that, you know, I'm not that worried um, if it's if it's contamination from the farmyard. If, if, the, if the chlamydia or if the toxo is there, around that um around that aborted fetus there's a high chance it has caused the abortion so um don't disinfect anything sometimes we get bags coming into us full of jay's fluid and the fetus floating inside on the bottom of it and and that's not what we want either 
that's that's you know you're 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 lessening the chances of us being able to get an agent there for you. So when we get the sample to the lab, just maybe to give our listeners an idea of the timeline on it, because you can do your gross examination relatively quickly, Shane, but to actually follow that through with the lab work, how long are we talking? Yeah. So first off, just to mention on that, our um, diagnostic rates when it comes to infectious abortion are very good. We have, we have, um, and over the last few years, especially, we have improved the the type of diagnostics we use a lot. So we we're now, um, you know, and everyone's so used for with COVID now that they're, everyone's an expert on the PCR. But it's PCR based tests we use mainly for for these. We also do um, some cultures on them. Um, but the problem with those things is that they they take time. So generally, when a when a, a fetus is submitted to us, when an abortion material is submitted to us, it'll be tested the same day. And but to get that result back and to make sure that we're reporting out the correct result, that can take a week to ten days. And us in the lab, we're, we're very conscious, especially when it comes to sheep abortions, that we don't want to give out a false positive result because we're very aware that you know if if we diagnose a chlamydia abortion, so if we uh, diagnose in zoatic abortion there in a flock. We're very cognizant that a farmer is going to make a fairly substantial economic decision on vaccination based on that result. So we want to make sure we're right. And in order to have those tests and in order to have those all double checked, you know, you're talking generally about a, a week to 10 days is what a result takes. Sometimes it'll be faster, but I think realistically, this time of year, when we're at our busiest, a week to 10 days is what you'd expect. Now, the one thing I'd say to anyone submitting things into us is don't be afraid to lift the phone to us. Um, and uh, because we're, we're, um, we're more than happy to, you know, to uh, tell you where, where we're at on the, on the testing of, of your material. And sometimes, you know, even just knowing that there's a result on the way can put people's minds at rest. It, we know it's a very stressful time. Anytime anyone is dealing with um, a, a big outbreak of sickness in a in a flock or on a farm, you know, the, the days pass very slowly, the hours pass very slowly, and all people want is something definite that they'll be able to get a result. But it has to be the right one or else we're all wasting our time. And Shane, on that, like in some cases, we are actually only planning for next year. In the case of a toxic outbreak, there's nothing you can really do at the time bar plan for next year on it. There's probably an argument there for a need for repeat sampling in some cases or submitting more than just one to get an accurate diagnosis. Yeah, so, so when, somebody is, when somebody is confronted with a proper abortion storm, or, so when they have more than one um, abortion occurring on the farm and maybe a number in, over the space of a few days, uh, what I advise to them is keep submitting the stuff into us until we get the diagnosis, until we have a diagnosis out to you, then you can stop. But uh, keep getting the things into us because it's it's funny, you know. Sometimes, sometimes, especially in the more um, unusual causes of abortion, so things maybe like Q fever, coxiella. Sometimes with the salmonellas, it can be hard to get the material uh, uh, positive straight away. And the more the more chances we get at doing the test, the more chances we're going to have um, of getting a, a good result there. You're right what you're saying about the things like toxo, where if I get a positive this year, there's probably not a whole lot you're going to be able to do with it until the back end of next year where you're going to vaccinate the O's and where you're going to try and prevent it coming on next year. But it's still very important to get the diagnosis at this stage because you won't get a chance to get it later on. And uh, the, the opportunity will have passed. And what I tell sheep farmers, especially when it comes to proper infectious outbreaks of abortion is invariably when they look back on it they have got a warning so you might have the first year you might have a few a few animals abort but then the second year all hell breaks loose and um it's it's all very well being wise in retrospect so that's why it's important that you get the the early ones in you, you never know the trouble you've missed. So, you know, that's why when it comes to vaccination and things like that, I never think that it's a waste of time because you never know what you've saved yourself by doing something that's preventative. No, and if you talk to anyone that's been through any of them abortion storms, the first thing they will tell you is if they're known in time. Look, just something they're very conscious of, like they're not all infectious, but some of the infectious agents you talked about there are zoonotic. From a farmer's own perspective and handling that material or dealing with that yo, even down to how we treat that yo within a flock and isolate them, you know, correct biosecurity, correct handling chain, how important is that? 
Yeah. So there's, I, I'd split that up into two, two different aspects. Okay. So the, the first is the zoonotic. So the chances of something being passed on to the farmer or to a human from, from this aborted joe. So that'd be one side of it. And then the other we can talk about is um, how you to prevent infection being passed from sheep to sheep. But the, the main thing is the human health in these situations. And unfortunately, a lot of these agents, so things like toxo, chlamydia, the coxiella, some of the salmonellas, the listerias, th these agents that we find in, in ovine abortions, they can cause a lot of damage to humans as well. And um, specifically to anyone that's pregnant. So, you know, on a family farm where there's um, there could be a risk of pregnant women helping with um, a sheep. You have to be very careful around lambing time. Like we we would have a very strict um, policy in our labs that um, if anyone is pregnant or if anyone is trying to be pregnant, they're not in the PM room when we're dealing with ovine abortions um, because there's there's just such a risk there. So it's like it's like when we talk about all these uh, infectious things that we've got so used to with COVID, correct PPE. So things like wearing gloves that's very important that there's no food being being consumed um, without proper disinfection without cleaning down without changing overalls without washing because most of these things infect people through the oral route where they you end up swallowing down something that can cause the problem and um, so that's that's from the human side of it and Shane like in that the gear you're wearing the water was how they've been handled and washed afterwards have to be cognizant of that too that that is a route to bring it back to the household Oh, it's, it's it's very easy. It's very easy to bring back um, these infections, and especially in the the hellfire of uh, lamb and time when you're in and out and trying to grab a bite to eat. And um, what I find uh, is um, when I used to work in practice as a vet, what I used to find worked for me was to have a few different changes of my lamb and of my lambing gear and of my calving gear and have a, a bucket of disinfectant there, steep them in the bucket of disinfectant and then you have a, a dry a dry set to put on in between. Um, but uh, it's, the, it's the wet material, the, the birth fluids left on the overalls, they're the things that can spread the infection and they're the things that can very easily be ingested by humans. Jane, the second aspect of that, within the flock itself, the spread from UTO or between animals, between lambs and shit, like that's another aspect that needs a certain level of management. Yeah, so in, in, in the face, so we're assuming that this is a, an infectious cause of abortion. And until you have a diagnosis, I think it's prudent to treat every abort, abortion as an infectious cause of abortion until you know otherwise. Um, so uh, the, way, the way all of these things are spread is um, via the birth fluids, via contamination from the fetus, from the aborted fetus at lambing time. So that's how that's how the, the main spread occurs. And so it means that if you have a yo that has aborted, it's very important that you keep away other pregnant animals from that aborted yo, from the, the 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 birth fluids, from the placenta, from the fetuses that have aborted. Um, it's also important that if you have other uh, female sheep, so if you have a bunch of hoggets or something there on the farm that might be going in lamb the following year, that they are kept away from these. That there's because sometimes what happens is is that the infection might be spread, but you won't see the abortion this year. But that will stay in the um, things like the chlamydia and the toxo. They can stay in the animal, and they'll only express themselves when that animal is heavily pregnant again the following year. So that's the way, really, things like um, in zoatic abortion in yours. That's how it's spread from year to year. It's it's from um, animals getting into contact with the birth fluids, the contaminated birth fluids, one year, and then going on to to develop it themselves in following years. So it's it's very important that when a yo aborts, when a single yo aborts, that she's isolated. And by isolated, I mean that she's kept away from any other pregnant animals, any other female animals that may become pregnant in future years for a few days until all those birth fluids are, are, are cleared up. So really what you're talking about there, and it can be a difficult thing to organise in the middle of lambing time, but really what you're talking about there is that you need a, a yard or you need a part of the shed that's separate from the rest of it that you can put these animals out into. 
There's probably no harm to have in most farms anyway is an isolation pen or a sick pen where you can actually treat individuals. But no, it's a very important point. Jane, I'm just cognizant too that some of these animals that are bought, we often see them reappearing for sale again. We see people buying foster yews or pet lambs. It's a very risky thing to do at a busy lamb period, introducing them into a lamb shed. It is because you have to, you have to think why are they for sale? That's that's the question I'd be asking, and it's it's one of the first questions we ask when we're investigating an abortion outbreak. Is what have you bought in recently? What has come into your what has come into your flock recently? So I know that I know that everyone is trying to maximise. Um, they're they're trying to maximise the output of lambs every year they have. But I think sometimes it can be a very false economy to try to bring in a, a, a yo whose lambs have already died into your flock. The danger is, is that you're going to bring in something new there into your flock that maybe you hadn't before this. It's certainly a busy time. It's a time to be vigilant and look in the case as any outbreak we see. Starting time, investigating time, sometimes you're planning for next year, but it's important that we do something and act on it. Yeah, I, the, the, the main thing is that you know, you, you act early on these things and because they, unfortunately, and we see this time and time again with all sorts of things that come into our lab, is that infectious things rarely go away by themselves. That if you're unfortunate enough to, to just be, to, to, to be infected with something, unfortunately, the only way it's going to go away is until you get a diagnosis and until you find a way to tackle it. Jane, you have a busy couple of weeks ahead. We really appreciate you giving up your time to be with us. It's very important we deal with these issues at the moment. Thanks again for coming on today. Uh, absolute pleasure. We're going to finish the episode up at this point. As Shane has highlighted, if you do encounter flock health issues this spring, get in contact with your local vet early and consider submitting samples to the RVLs. It's the first step in identifying what the cause is and addressing the issue on your own farm. There is a network of RVLs around the country and they're there to assist you where you encounter for health issues within your own farm. That's it for me for this episode. Again, for any updates from our sheep program, keep an eye on our Twitter page at Chocolate Sheep. I'm Kieran Lynch. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe and listen in to any of our episodes.